Can a proof be too elegant and in fact hinder communication? I believe yes, and I use Hilder's inequality to illustrate my point. This is everyone's beloved formula from analysis, so I will be quick here. Let me just recall how it's proven here and there. First, one starts by observing that you can scale both sides. They scale the same way if you multiply f or g or both with numbers. And therefore, you can assume that their norms is equal to 1. And therefore, all that remains to be shown is that integral fg is less than or equal to 1. And then the key point where inequality comes in is Young's inequality, which says that for any two numbers, their multiplication is less than this particular summation of pth power and qth power of them. And now that we know this holds almost everywhere, we integrate it, and the magical part where the initial scaling assumption comes in, you get 1 over p plus 1 over q, and the magical choice of the p and q to be conjugates makes it equal to 1, end of the proof. I don't know about you, but the first time I saw this proof, I was just puzzled. I felt stupid, and I was like, no way ever in the world I can ever come up with that idea. And uh, I believe this is not constructive if we want people to understand proofs and be able to recreate them and see the ideas behind them. This proof, in many ways, is written backwards, so let me make a few comments on a specifics here. First, the scaling fact, uh, argument in the beginning. So the blue parts I have copy pasted and I have some comments in red. So what is the point of Hilder's inequality? That you can control fg by integrating larger powers of those functions. Now, if you take a larger power of a number, then it becomes extremely small if the numbers are small. So for very small numbers, the very question of whether you can control x by x to the p is in is the issue. Now, the normalizations in the proof that start, remember integral is on an average sense this function is near 1, but the values, individual values, can still be going all the way to infinity and going all the way down to zero. So normalizing integral of fp and integral of g to the q equal 1 does not make values of f of x either away from zero or away from infinity. It can just as well do whatever it wants. So what does it really then contribute to in the proof? That scaling does not help Young's inequality to hold. We have not made any scaling for the individual fx and gx. Young's inequality holds because it holds for all numbers. Although this part itself is very deep itself because um, I don't think any undergraduate would come up with this inequality on their own. No one looks at a number p and says let me find the number q so that 1 over p plus 1 over q is equal to 1 and then there will be some inequality of this very specific po uh, form to hold for all pairs of numbers. Um, and it's really sharp. So that's another point in the in the proof. Then the third point where you just add and magically this scaling saves the day, it just seems too lucky and too coincidental. And that's the type of argument that is really dangerous. If something is truly um, sharp and depends on the very precise choices, that has to be justified in the proof, explained why nothing else would have worked. Or if scaling to precisely equal to 1 is just a convenience, that also should be kind of apparent from the proof. What if we scale them to 2 or 1 and half? Would all fall apart or is 1 just the most convenient one? So we see that this scaling actually comes at the very end. So you could reverse the steps 2 and 1 in the original proof. To illustrate this, I want to give a simpler version of Hilder's inequality, but for those interested, from this lemma, which involves only one function, you, you can actually prove the Hilder's inequality with two functions. You have to make a clever choice for the measure. 
to bring it that second function g i leave that as an exercise for you guys anyway this lemma is itself very strong and it just says that um average integral so every time we have a dash through the integral sign that means we divide the end result of the integral by measure of the whole space x which have we have assumed to be positive and finite so it makes sense um, so this is even if you apply this to the counting measure it's still interesting so this is saying that the average of n numbers positive numbers is less than averaging pth power of those numbers and then taking pth root. This lemma is actually the more often used version of Hilder's inequality because we want to show for instance if you have an LP function on a bounded set in Rn then f belongs to a smaller LQ if q is smaller than p. So I just advertise that this lemma is very useful and convenient to use in practice and already strong enough to imply the full Hilder Nikadi. Let me now go through a proof of this. So the first observation again is that somewhere we have to compare f of x to f of x to the p. Okay, we cannot make x smaller than x to the p even if we help it with any number. That will fail for a small x. But um, so without b this would fail only for a very small x. So when x is small, we add a, a constant beta to compensate. Now this kind of an inequality is easy to believe to hold for all x positive. For large x, we don't need beta because this will be much larger than x itself. For very small x, this beta will come in and hopefully in the middle you can uh, fix things to work out uh, with the choices of alpha and beta. I'm not looking for the sharp alpha and betas, so it's even more easier to believe in. Okay, once you have such an inequality, you integrate, you get star. So now you have some control of integral of f in terms of integral of f to the p. <clears throat> but now we are starting to hate this beta here because there is no f in it. And here this is a common trick in analysis when you want to get rid of one of the quantities you can do so if you know that the two terms are comparable in size. So therefore uh, if we assume something like integral of f to the p is not too small in that case this term and this term are comparable. This is a constant and this is not too small. And when we write out the inequality in precision, we get double star. So integral of f is bounded by integral of f to the p up to this constant alpha plus 2 beta. And this is not Hilder's inequality because we don't have 1 over p there. But notice that actually this is stronger than Hilder's inequality if integral of f to the p is less than 1 because raising a number to a power less than 1 makes it a bigger number. So this is bigger than that provided that we are less than 1. So in the, in the range of integral of f to the p, integral average of f to the p being between 1 half and 1, we actually have proven something better than the Hilder's inequality. Of course, Hilder's inequality ultimately gives this version, but remember we're moving to prove Hilder's inequality. Um, the problem with double star and the, the reason we're not too satisfied with it is that if you are dealing with average integral bigger than one, then raising to 1 over p will make it way smaller. So this can become way smaller. If you are in 10 million and you take 1 over p through it, you just uh, slash that number by a lot. We have proven that our uh, left hand side is smaller than that, but does that mean it's smaller than this one also? We don't know. 
we can retain some control between the pth root and the number if it is not too large. So if there is some control, let's say 2, then integral average of f to the p2 power 1 over p, if we help it with a tiny bit, will still beat a bigger one. And then double star gives us this. Okay, so we were able to put the root 1 over p at the cost of multiplying by a controllable number. So we have this inequality, which is now Hilder's inequality, for this regimen. Now we have some inequality that scales the right way. If this inequality holds, holds for some f, it holds for all multiples lambda of f, and therefore this restriction gets removed after all. So this holds for all f without the initial restriction. Because after choice of the correct lambda, we can have this uh, integral between 1 half and 2. But, of course, we can have it just equal to 1. And in that case, if we trace all these inequalities above, we will get rid of the 2's. So, you will end up with integral average f less than or equal the alpha plus beta integral average of f to the p, the whole thing to the power of 1 over p. It's a simple exercise to show that this inequality here can be attained by a choice of alpha and beta that makes it equal to x. 1. There will be this concave up function alpha x to the p plus beta. And also you can see from this proof why this alpha, why 1 over p and 1 over q naturally come in. The slope has to be 1. Derivative of that concave function is alpha p x to p minus 1. And when you set x equal to 1, it's alpha p. And that should be 1 because it's tangent to y equal x. And therefore alpha is 1 over p. Hilder Nikali was an example to illustrate my point which was that some proofs can be too short, too elegant, uh, leave you scratching your head. For those proofs, don't lose hope. Try to go through the steps yourselves and say what I would think if I were to prove this from scratch.